I notice also that people who do get better from this uh, quite, quite quickly are people who are very willing to You're take You're listening to In Your Pants with Dr. Susie G, the physiotherapist for your private, helping you get in the know down below. Hi, friends. Welcome to another In Your Pants podcast. This is Dr. Susie G. I'm so glad that you all are here with me today. On today's show, honestly, I am so starstruck. I have novelist, author, critic, translator, Tim Parks on the show today. Tim Parks is the author of one of my favorite books on the topic of male pelvic pain in men. This is actually his memoir, Teach Us to Sit Still. And Tim and I just talk very candidly and frankly about his experience with pelvic pain and his journey throughout the years with it. And it is really a conversation, just like his book is, about hope and recovery, which is the most important takeaway message from our conversation today. But we go through some of his challenges that he experienced throughout his course of pelvic pain, and then we chat about the most um, impactful part of his recovery and what really ultimately helped him to navigate out of pelvic pain. So I'm so excited to share this interview with you all. I hope you enjoy it just as much as I did interviewing Tim Parks. Hello, Tim. Thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Hi, Susie. Hi. So Teaching Us to Sit Still, which is the novel that we're going to be really talking about for this show, was one of the very first novels that I actually read on the topic of pelvic pain in in men and is really my favorite to this day. I recommend it often. For those who are listening who may have not read your book yet, could you briefly describe to us what the book is about and what inspired you to write down your personal story? Okay, so not not a novel, really, a memoir. Um, it's just a book. It's just a book where I tried to go back in my mind over the events of what were probably three or four years at that point, how I had fallen into a really very miserable condition, both both physical and then because of the physical, psychological. Um, which lasted quite a long time, alas, and then, and then, and then, how very gradually I, I got out of that. Uh, so, so the book, the book starts in a bad place, um, and it gradually comes out of that bad place. I mean, it's not a book about a miracle cure or anything, but I suppose most of all, it's a sort. It was a sort of personal investigation of what had been the state of mind and the state of my body and also the state of the world. Um, because I, I don't think it's, uh, like, I, I don't think it's an accident that a lot of guys and women have the kind of problems that I had. Uh, I think it's to do with the world we live in and to do with this kind of mental space that we create and so on. So I was just trying to put like, on the one hand, tell the story cause it isn't quite an interesting story. Um, and also it's nice to tell a story when it's not going to end badly, uh, you know, and, and then it was really kind of a reflection on, so, you know, what is this world that, that pushes us into this situation? Right. Right. And so what hopes did you have as far as, you know, writing your memoir, what was your intention for writing the memoir, if any? Well, I should say that, you, you know, normally I'm a novelist and uh, I've written literary novels and books about Italy where I live. Uh, when I wrote the first chapter of this book and sent it to my agent, he, he said, don't, you know, the last thing, the last thing a man needs in the world is to say he's got problems down there, you know, um, and, and, and that's kind of obvious. I, I, I remember when one one major U.S. publisher turned down the book because he said nobody would want to read a book with the word prostate prominently in the opening pages. Wow. I mean, um, and th this is a very serious literary American publisher. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
you know, the book was a risk for me, but uh, you know, I didn't become I didn't become a writer to do what other people tell me. So, <laughs> well no, said. really, I'm, yeah, but you know, I I don't write the books they ask me to write. So it was really. A, a, a book like this for me, and there have been two or three books of, of this kind for me, mm -hmm. was very much a, a question of, of, of exploring what I really think about things. Like mm -hmm. a book is a space where you can, it's probably the biggest space available in the world today for a, a single person where you can organize what you think about something, you know? Um, so so that, that's what it was. Uh, and, and also the book is actually quite funny and a lot of a lot of fun in, at moments as well, partly because I was very happy to be out of the problem right. and it was interesting to go back over it, you know. Right, right. And and you do bring lightness to a topic that has really a lot of darkness. And I do see it as a book of or a memoir of hope, right, a story, an actual story of, of a person who has lived and experienced a, a very deep struggle and, and a profound one at that, that it seems to me that has shaped the, the trajectory of your life moving forward. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Look, let, I mean, let's put a bit of narrative in it so that so that people can get a sense of this. You you are a very busy guy. I mean, you know, I was teaching to make money, translating to make money, and then writing also to make money, but but writing what I wanted to write. Uh, and I had, you know, a wife and 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 two, then three children. Um, and I was living in Italy, so that means I'm operating in a foreign language most of the time. Uh, so I'm a very very busy guy, and all of a sudden, this apparently successful life, well, successful life more or less, um, is interrupted by. A series of pains. I mean, I'm sure people following your channel will be aware of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All the, you know, abdomen pains, uh, frequent urination, uh, difficulty sitting down for long periods of time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I would find that I couldn't sit down. Like I would go to give a conference on something and then find that, you know, it was going to be really hard work to get through to the, the end if I had to sit down, you know. I took to, to standing up to speak actually in that period because of it. You know, people saw oh, how impressive this is, but actually it was just because I couldn't sit down. So all that's going on, you know, and they and and all of a sudden your life look, you say, well, if, if it's gonna be like this for the rest of my life, you know, I, I really don't want this. At the time, at the time there wasn't really much literature on pelvic pain. I mean, everything was considered to be prostate pain. So, you know, the doctors then start frightening you with possibility of cancer and bladder cancer, prostate cancer, and then at the very least, um, an operation to put a kind of freeway through your prostate. Uh, and then big issues about what sex would be like after that. And uh, yeah, the word issues was not a joke there. Oh, I didn't mean it as a joke anyway. Um, so... You know, uh, that was the situation. And then very gradually, thanks to the internet, thanks to finally beginning to get a view on this whole problem of muscle tension and so on, I began to realize that, that you could, as it were, breathe your way and exercise your way out of this problem. But I also realized that in order to do that, I was going to have to change my lifestyle big mm -hmm. time. Um, uh, you had to change my attitude to my body big time um, to the whole question of enjoying myself and what was enjoyment and so on in any way to cut a long story short with, with the help of breathing exercises some shiatsu massage uh, and, and then an introduction to meditation uh, I, I began to sort out this problem. It took about it took about two years, I think, to get to a point where I felt the physical situation was solved. But the interesting thing was that uh, the whole business of meditating and so on made me very aware of all those tensions that wired up the desire to achieve, be a winner, you know. Oh, um, 
over anxious about the world. Uh, that all that stuff was was actually kind of in there as well. Like you know, the whole physical thing was wrapped up with the whole way of living. So. So, you know, I mean, I don't think you ever get completely out of that. I mean, it's not like I've become a Buddha or anything, but, but, um, but you, you do begin to learn, you know, when to, when to chill out a lot more. Uh, like now I meditate or we meditate with my partner every morning. We do 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, not quite every day. I mean, sometimes it's good to have a lie in. Uh, but uh, I don't do, you know, half an hour to an hour of yoga every day, whatever. But, but most of all, um, a sort of different attitude to the body, a different attitude to work, you know. Um, I think all those things were very important. And uh, from that day on, from, from that period on, uh, when the book came out particularly, uh, I, I just started to get tons of mail from people in the same situation. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not, because obviously, you know, it's not something I wanted to turn into a profession or anything. I, I just wanted to write about it. But it was very clear to me from the email and from my conversations with fellow sufferers, it was very clear to me that there's, there's a big issue of lifestyle and people with with um, people with major conflicts on their hands, like an unhappy marriage or a job, they're not they're not in the right place, you know. And all that can lead to the kind of tension where your whole body is just gripping all the time, you know, and where you're you're punishing yourself partly because you have projects that you don't consider to be, you know, the right projects and so on. I so appreciate the reference to working in uh, opposed to working out as one could say right you know um, really the, the premise of is, is teaching us to sit still from your book is how to how to how to put the snow globe down right you're just so tussled and you do have a chapter that Absolutely. says a tussle in the mind um, there's so much chaos. And when you kind of put that down for a second, allow that flutter to just settle down, how profound that in itself is a teaching and, a, and an insight into the inner world or the inner experience of self, the embodied self, and also the experience of, of pain and where that is all coming from, right? Because the biomedical model has a very myopic view of the situation, in my opinion. Help, you yeah. know, helpful for, for, for certain things, not discounting it, but it was truly not all encompassing of the humanistic side of care or the humanistic approach to addressing a lived experience of, of an adver adversity, whether that's physical pain, emotional pain, often both. For sure. Well, I, I mean, you know, it's clear that, 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 that modern medicine um, is, is a wonderful thing when uh, we have a situation where a very clear intervention uh, can, can be helpful. I mean, um, and in the present world we're living in now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say no to a vaccine when, when, when it's finally offered me. Um, but because those things make sense. I think when the problem is, one of the problems is that medicine then gets this... Uh, totally fixed and uh, channeled vision of the world where it's imagined that whenever there is pain, there is a solution of this variety, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you come along with, with pelvic pain and you say, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to solve this by, by putting a big hole through your prostate so that, you know, you'll pee easily and that will sort out that. Uh, and then you say, well, what about all these other pains I'm having? And they say, well, Actually, we don't we don't know why you're having those pains, you know. But but they still want to intervene on something and so on. So it's it's clear that you know we all we're all hugely admiring of, of medicine, but but concerned about medicine when it just wants to intervene without thinking of all the all the other repercussions. Uh, let's. But talking about sitting still, you know, 
I'd, I'd like to talk about that for a minute. I mean, you say, you know, we can stop for a second and that's very therapeutic. Um, I think the problem for me at the beginning was I had probably never stopped. Uh, I remember the first time I decided to follow this series of exercises called paradoxical relaxation by the famous Dr. Wise, uh, who one of the one of the big guys earlier in this field. Um, and it's basically a, a, a meditative situation where you learn to observe your breathing uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and you're invited to empty your mind of, of language, you know. I think this was the first time I'd ever done that. You know, I was 50-something. It was the first time I had tried to be awake without thinking in words, you know. Um, so it wasn't easy. It wasn't like something I, I immediately realized, oh, yeah. It took me... I did begin to realize quite quickly that if you did manage it, you got an, a relaxation effect in your lower abdomen that was extraordinary. And so that made it worthwhile going on. But then also just into, honestly, just as a guy, a writer, I got interested in it, you know? And, and the funny thing is that even getting interested in it, in it, getting more interested in that than in my problem was therapeutic because a problem tends to, take over your world you know there's just you and your problem um so i i began to follow those practices and somebody told me to start going to meditation retreats which i was very much against because i i was kind of an anti-religious person um i'm not anti-religious now but i'm certainly not religious um it is extremely difficult to sit still to sit still and by still, when you get into the world of, of that kind of meditation, you, you genuinely mean still, like you're sitting still. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go to meditation places and see a guy sit as still as a Buddha for two hours. And you just think, how can, how, how can they do that? You know, what is happening in that guy's body and mind that means that he's not suffering? Because when I sat still, it was like sitting on coals. It was like sitting on, you know, pins and needles and, and then my mind going crazy and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, these guys, they, they can gradually teach you how to do this. And I learned how to do this. Uh, and, it, and it is a huge, a huge thing when uh, for the first time you begin, you begin to say, wait a minute, actually life is a little bit easier than I thought it was. I don't need to be so wired up. I don't need all this stuff. You know, I can still be very efficient. I mean, I, I think I'm probably more efficient. Um, but I don't do it to be efficient. I do it because, because it's wonderful and, uh, and so on. So I actually think that this medical condition is very much linked to a modern Western lifestyle. Uh, to somebody stationary, somebody sitting down, somebody over a computer or something like that, wired up with uh, somatizing in the stomach, in the abdomen, in the lower and pelvic floor, um, getting stiffer and angrier and all the, yeah, I mean, you know this, this situation. So, uh, Yes, the and book was, the book was a sort of invitation to say, hey, you know, let's think about this in terms of our families, the way we were brought up. Also, you know, Western philosophy, if you want, Christianity, what like what Christianity invites you to think about your body and so on. Like my parents, very religious. Uh, my father's a Anglican clergyman. My parents were very much into the charismatic movement. Um, and, and the body was just a vessel, you know, it was just a container for me. Uh, and so there was no need to teach. Like you, had to, you had to dress properly and put a tie on, but that wasn't respect for your body. That was respect for, you know, society and the church and God. But no particular respect was necessary for your body. And when you got ill... You call the doctor and the doctor comes along and the doctor gives you a medicine and maybe, you know, you get better. And when you get better, you think you got better because of the medicine. And maybe you did, but maybe you, maybe you would have got better anyway. 
But that was about it, really, in terms of thinking about the body. Um, and, and even if you think about what we did at school, you know, we, we did biology and, you know, you're invited to look at skeletons and uh, blood, blood circulation. They never invite you to think about the relationship between muscles, organs, bones. Uh, they never invite you to look at your own body and say, you know, look, feel that, that, what's it feel like? What's it really feel like? So, you know, it was a different time, maybe, you know, 1950s, 60s. Um, maybe it's different now, you know. I know that in British schools now, a lot of schools actually do mindfulness. I mean, you know. No kidding. It's, they do. They do. British schools do mindfulness. I'm happy to hear that. I have a bit yeah, of no, a bias. Brits, <laughs> the Brits are, the, funnily, the Brits are a bit weird. But on this, they're, they're quite ahead now. Mm. Um, strangely enough, strangely enough. Yeah, they, they get the kids to sit for 10 minutes and just concentrate on what it what it feels like. Yeah. That's Think amazing. About. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say I'm a bit of a bias. I have a bias with everything you're saying because I, too, for the past several years, uh, am a practicing Buddhist and have also experienced the profound effects of of meditation and mindfulness and alertness practices in my life. And so it's, it's experiential. It really is. You can, you can, we can talk about it and describe it, but it's kind of like eating a piece of chocolate and you're, you've eaten it, but the person next to you hasn't eaten it yet. And you're trying to describe how amazing, well, if you like chocolate, let's just assume you like chocolate, <laughs> but you're trying to describe it. <laughs> Yeah, but even that, if you think about it, I mean, we everybody eats. So you can say to them, well, it's like eating something new that you'd really like. Yes. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a very funny conversation about this with, um, with a, 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 neuro, a neuroscientist who was, he was one of these guys who was doing tests on Buddhist monks to see what happens in their yes. brain when they, when they meditate, you know? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, and he was saying, yeah, you know, they, you can see that the gamma rays go up and this and that area of the brain and so on. Uh, and I said to him, you know, so, so he said, well, so we can see that meditation is probably useful. And I said, have you ever meditated? And he Good said, question. no. And I said, look, imagine, you know, imagine you've never had sex. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now this is getting interesting. Describing, <laughs> describing sex as a series of, you know, things that happen in the penis and things that happen in the brain. You know, does that really tell anybody what it's like to have sex? Not at all. If you had meditated, you would never have needed to do all these neurological exams because you would be perfectly aware. Uh, Very true. So well, yeah. so well put. So well put. Speaking of sex, actually, this is <laughs> now that yeah. we've opened up that Pandora's box. I remember a part of the book where you were asked to write a preface based on a novel called Il Bel Antonio about impotence. Right. I'm curious how your sexual identity evolved over the course of, of this health journey and your struggle with, you know, in bunny, in air quotes here, chronic prostatitis and, and what you would recommend to others as far as their struggles facing a similar situation as, you know, with their sexual identity and sexual health and how, how that's all enmeshed in this narrative. Well, let me say these things are very difficult to talk about because, uh, that, more difficult than just talking about the physical things like urination or something like that, because here you'd have to talk about your relationship with somebody else, right. okay. well, which I have no intention of doing. Um, but let me say this, let me say this. It's clear that when you're in a relationship that's in difficulty for some reason, um, sex will inevitably become part of that difficulty one way or the other. I mean, you might have a wonderful sexual life to counterbalance what's going on uh, in other areas, or, or, the, or the sexual life might fall into, as it were, disrepair because, because you're, you're, you're just not talking to each other or something like that, or, be, or because you hate each other. Um, and if you're going through stuff like that and going through this other stuff here, there's going to be all kinds of problems going on. And the idea that you can solve one problem without solving another, it's not gonna happen. Um, 
I don't think you're going to walk away from a pelvic pain problem without very seriously looking at, at some stuff somewhere that's going on in your life. It might not be relationships. It might not be a sexual problem. Um, but, but you mentioned the novel Il Bel Antonio. Um, it's a fantastic novel, Italian novel of written in the fascist period. Uh, and basically, Il Bel Antonio it, is an incredibly handsome guy who marries uh, an incredibly beautiful woman, but he, but he can't get it up, uh, and particularly he can't get it up with her. Um, and in a Sicilian world, because this is a Sicilian novel, the idea of, of, of not being potent just becomes like this, this huge, very common, it's a very funny book. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's called The Bel Antonio in, in English. You, you can get it. Uh, it's available. It's, it's a famous book. Um, so it's a book about impotence, basically, and about the role then that impotence places in, in society, but in your life and psychologically. Well, I think most guys will go through a period of impotence sooner or later. Uh, and certainly most guys who run up into to issues in their marriages and... Uh, uh, divorces uh, and so on and so forth um, and certainly like in my case I felt that when I went through a period like that it was clearly linked to all kinds of stuff that was going on uh, and and again you know imagine that I'd gone to some doctor who had who had looked for a physical solution to this problem I mean it would have been nutty you know but a lot of people like physical solutions because the, you know, because solving your own life is one of the most, yeah, you know, you know, it's pretty much the most, the most tough thing to do. I mean, to actually change, you know. Um, Absolutely, it's hard when that so, mirror is reflecting what's going on on the inside, and to actually kind of peek at it, you know. It's you know, I don't know how you, I don't know how useful it is even to think in terms of inside and outside. Mm. I think that is, you know, inside and outside, it, it all feels pretty much the same to me. Mm. In our heads, we have a bunch of neurons, um, uh, a body in the world, and an experience. You know, I, I don't, I don't need it. I don't even think we need to place it inside. Like when I'm. When I'm meditating with my eyes closed, I'm as outside as I am as I am now. Um, outside, inside, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, I know that it's kind of useful just to say, to distinguish between maybe what what's uh, what we normally call psychological and what we would call an obvious physical problem, like. It's non-dualistic. Obviously... It's what I'm hearing. There's no no such dualism that exists, right? Is what you're saying because it's it's this the environment, all of these factors that you've mentioned throughout our whole conversation about our narrative, our relationships, um, the contextual, social, cultural factors, interpersonal. All of those are they're just enmeshed. It's like this enmeshment of a, a sense of embodiment of how we interact with the world and how the interworld in the world interacts back and there is no you know i think that is the issue as far as the separation between you know there's so much separation and compartmentalizing of absolutely well science that's, i mean science has its successes by compartmentalization you know it has a laboratory and it separates something and then it studies that something and, and that's fine. I mean, it, it is fine. Uh, but we know actually that in our lives, none of it's separate. Um, uh, and even saying things like us and the world gets complicated. I mean, the world is, is very largely, as it were, my experience, you know? Like we know that, we know that when an animal sees the world, it's a completely different world of color and so on. We know that when a bat sees the world, it's mm -hmm. constructed with ultra waves. So, you know, the world is, is very largely 
But our experience is the world interacting with the body. So, so there, I actually wrote many years later another book, more, more of a fun book in many ways, called, called Out of My Head, which mm. is looks at a whole philosophy of thinking about about experience where where experience actually happens outside your head like the experience is the world your body encounters as it were mm -hmm. so but anyway to keep this practical um i think it it genuinely changes uh the way you the way you behave on, an, on a normal level uh, if you start realizing um, that your constant attempts to control the world, to, to be uh, super wired up, uh, obsessively getting everything right, and then to control a relationship, even when a relationship isn't working, um, to find some way around the problem, mm -hmm. okay, if, if one starts realizing that maybe all that is the wrong place to be, it, it can be terribly helpful for little practical things like having a pain in the ass, you know, <laughs> to put it brutally. Yeah. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts because you had mentioned, and I'll quote the sentence, um, that this was another thing about this condition, a symptom almost. I was absolutely determined not to talk about it. I wanted to come out of it without ha anyone having known. And I can imagine, um, and from the narratives of those that I work with uh, so far, that this is, of course, very distressing as you're describing this, this symptom, as you put it. I'm curious as to why do you think it was so challenging to to talk about it or to, to have, um, you know, more of a social support, which we, which at least from the literature that I've read is a very, um, it's a prognostic factor as far as recovery and how important social support is that camaraderie, the, um, just having someone to share their own story with you, who is also struggling in a similar way. So what are your thoughts, like, what are your thoughts about that? And what, if anything, would have made it easier to talk about it with others based on your experience? Well, let's say first, the world has changed enormously. Um, I was having these problems when I was about 50. So that's the, the, the early noughties, like 2003, 2004. Um, there was no social media, uh, or if there was, I wasn't on it. Um, that it would have been very early days. There was email and, and so on. Um, fortunately, there was the internet. But, you know, there weren't all these support groups everywhere. And let's face it, even, even now, but certainly much more in the past, I mean, it, it, it's difficult to, for a guy to start talking about problems that basically uh, kind of undermine your manhood, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and in a world where quite clearly, like quite clearly the, one of the main dynamics in the world today is success and failure, you know, particularly in the USA, obviously, mm -hmm. even more than in Europe. Um, so, I mean, talking about this kind of problem, apart from the, fa apart from the fact that it's, you know, you just feel that it is not a sort of savory thing to talk about, is it? It's not a sort of nice thing to talk about. You know, I've been peeing. I I, I went to the bathroom six, seven times last night. You know, um, it took me a long time to pee. I had a pain here um, after I've been after I after I've been to the bathroom in the morning. I felt I felt better. You know, it's it's not dinner table conversation, is it? And, but not only that, at the same time, you're saying I, I have a problem, right? And also, let me be honest, that I suspected, I think deep down from the beginning, that the problem was, was, was a kind of this problem as well. You know, it was kind of, I'm a guy who's, <laughs> who's screwed up as well, you know, at least to a degree. And I've always been a very jolly person, I think, as well. So, uh, I also grew up in a very 
Puritan evangelical household where you just didn't talk about this stuff, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. If you had a dick, it was because you were told not to touch it. And that was about yeah. it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so all that kind of thing had always been a big, big problem for me. Uh, talking about sex was fine, you know? But talking about that was, was more mm-hmm. difficult. Um, and in fact, it was a very major moment when, when I was able finally to begin to see what the, the nature of this problem was and to start getting better, I almost immediately felt that I could also speak about it. Uh, and I noticed that speaking about it, I already felt more confident that I could deal with it, um, mm-hmm. but not only deal with it, but that it was kind of okay, you know, that it was going to be all right. Uh, and that I could, and that even if I still had some kind of problem, it wasn't like the end of the world, you know? So I saw uh, talking helped me to get out of a catastrophic thinking mm-hmm. situation. Mm-hmm. That said, let, let me say that I remember spending some nights when I couldn't sleep, reading early chat lines on the internet from people suffering with pelvic. I remember, I remember I typed pelvic pain into the browser uh, for the first time because even pelvic pain was not a population you immediately arrive at when you have a problem in your stomach. I remember finding something like six million, <laughs> you know, entries. And then you start getting the, just this load of suffering, load of suffering. And you start realizing how many people have got this and how few of them have found an answer to it, at least in those days. Uh, and I must admit that was, that was kind of depressing. Uh, so that was a bad place to go. Uh, but, but later talking about, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was, uh, you know, in a certain sense, one of the reasons why I wrote the book just indicates why I'm probably not completely out of that mindset. I thought I'm going to turn this this problem, I'm going to turn this problem into a success. You know, and in fact, the book sold like despite my agent's initial preoccupations, it's it's sold pretty well. You know? Yes, but especially in in Europe, uh, not so well in the USA. That's interesting. That is interesting. So. Speaking of the web, so I, I love this and I have to I have to read it on page 130. I like underlined it multiple times here. <laughs> so I want to share it with others. But you wrote, the truth is we know nothing about our bodies. I thought nothing. What's in there? What's going on? Each research paper contradicts the next. Every discipline is scathing of the others. A second opinion, a third. The web is an ocean of confusion. Above all, every story told in words, every medical story in particular, is always a thousand times clearer than reality. However unhappy narrative is, of its very nature, reassuring, gives the illusion of knowing when all anyone ever really knows is how he's feeling now, now, and now in the instant. Uh, for me, I, for me, that just really was profound and really hit home with a lot of the narratives that, you know, I hear um, as far as in the work that I do. And and so this web, this ocean of confusion, as you put it, what would you advise for for a man who is currently in this situation and who's trying to navigate really limitless, the paradox of limitless information on the web, as it is very different now, right? There's yeah. so much contradictory. It's even more so. Yeah, what I mean, I get, a lot of ma- I get a lot of males like this, you know. I mean, it, it's been, I, I can't, it must quite a long time since I wrote the book, but I, I still get, you know, four or five males a week on this. And obviously in the past, it was a lot more. Uh, I think, you know, I think the first thing, the first thing you have to say is, uh, I always point them to a book or two, you know, I think David Wise's book is still useful, um, very useful. It, it was the first book that I, that's, that's the headache in the pelvis. Mm-hmm. 
it was the first book that I read that actually described the symptoms in a way that that was that was like it is. Um, and so once, you know, if you can establish that that is the area where you are, you know, if you haven't got some symptom that might genuinely be a bladder cancer or genuinely be. So once you've established that, you've got this really rather miserable chronic condition. Uh, so the great news is you're not going to die. Okay. And that, that's actually quite important <laughs> to have that in your head. Yeah, I'm not going to have you know, chemotherapy, blah, blah, blah. I mean, so I can stop doing medical tests. So that's the first, thing. you know, if you don't need the medical tests, just stop doing them because nothing will make you more ill than doing a lot of medical tests. Uh, and, then, and then say to yourself, this is going to be a long process. Let's make, let's make it, a, a good journey because because you're going to have to do it or, or keep suffering so if you're going to have to do it mm -hmm. then let's put it at the top of the curriculum as uh, the top of the top of my program uh, like let's not just say like I always used to say you know I can give quarter of an hour to this problem and then I've got to get on with my day you know uh, <laughs> So it's got to be the other way around. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm actually gonna give some prime time to this problem, and since giving prime time to the problem means not working, not looking after the children in that moment or whatever, I'm gonna enjoy it. I think if you get in that frame of mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually use this problem to learn how to chill out and to take a look at the way my life's going, like you know the stuff I'm doing. Uh, the jobs I'm in, the relationships I'm in, whatever it is, uh, particularly if there's something particularly conflicted going on. Um, you know, do I want to stay? Do I, do I want to live in Italy? Do I want to go back to the UK? You know, mm -hmm. do I want to be in this relationship? Do I want to leave? Uh, use, use the problem. And, and above all, uh, just accept that you might have a, you know, that you're getting up five, six times a night Stop worrying about it. Just do it. Uh, maybe it'll get better as, as you go on. But, but above all, don't get up and worry about it. Just, mm. just get up, you know. Uh, it's not easy at the beginning, but I was certainly very, very much helped when I, when I gradually began to accept that it was interesting to go to the, a couple of meditation retreats, you know. Uh, but I think a certain frame of mind is required, uh, helpful way you, you say, let's make it an exploration, you know? Like, let's go and talk to this crazy doctor, Susie. And, uh, <laughs> Which I'm know. so grateful and appreciate. Uh, appreciate let's go and talk to this young woman about, about my problems and, and, you know, let's be all right with that, you know? Mm. That kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I think this goes into the part of the book where you actually mentioned the headache in the pelvis and you alluded to the fact of the defensive reaction to pain is to pull away, right? To avoid it, to change it, to just um, do something other than that. Instead, you've, well, at least that's what Dr. Wise and the headache in the pelvis uh, like encouraged everyone to experiment with pushing towards or nudging towards the pain. Mm. I, I'm curious as far as what, what worked for you to do that, like successfully to kind of just nudge towards the pain rather than react or pull away from the pain so that those who are listening, who are experiencing it could experiment with as well. Yeah, uh, it was a long time ago. I slightly changed some of my positions on this, but l let's say that Wise in his book uh, invites you to do a simple test where, you know, you have a pain in your lower abdomen. Of course, we all pull away from pain. He just says, just, just imagine, just try pushing towards it as if you were going to pee or something, just, just pushing towards it. See what it feels like. See what it feels like. And I remember that, that I just thought, wow, yeah, actually, it relaxes a bit if you do that. So I would, you know, I thought, 
this guy Wise does know something about this stuff. Like none of the urologists I'd seen, you know, like intelligent guys. I mean, you know, uh, a couple couple of expensive ones. You know? mm -hmm. uh, they they hadn't been able to tell me that. Let me say that more generally uh, through the meditation and so on, uh, because obviously being in a sitting position to meditate can cause pain. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if you're going to stay meditating, you're going to have to learn how to how to deal with that, or what do you want to deal with that? And rather than pushing towards pain, I, I I've learned that actually, if you can just be with it and mm -hmm. and just start thinking that it has to be solved, I mean, like some pains have to be solved immediately, like you have a very serious appendicitis, you better solve it. That's what pain's for to Protective. tell you that there's a problem. Yeah. Once you know that, that the pain is a chronic pain that's not going anywhere mm -hmm. or a sitting pain, if you just learn to actually be with it and not even to think of it as pain, uh, not going toward, not trying to solve it, mm. uh, then, then actually all of a sudden it, there is a sort of change. It's not that it goes away. It's just that it doesn't like seem to be a problem anymore. Um, but I think everybody has to learn, has to, everybody is invited to experiment with this stuff, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, but, but definitely, obviously we grow up imagining that the way we are and the way we feel is that the way all human beings have always felt for all time. And then as you get, you know, as you get a little more experience and you read around a bit and you look at other cultures and stuff, you realize, actually, that's not true. You know, this notion that existentially we're all the same is maybe true only at the very deepest level. Like the hundreds of our behavior patterns, of our attitudes to pain, of our sensitivity to this and that is very much locked up in a cultural paradigm. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, can, you can get out of this kind of pain fairly easily, uh, mm -hmm. I would say. At the end of the day, I mean, fairly easily compared with other stuff. How profoundly is this situation or this health issue bound up with the light your life narrative or the life narrative you know personal issues need to change etc um what yeah, well, are your thoughts I, on that probably i've already talked too much about this you know um i mean i'm probably maybe i'm very affected by what my own case was but i've, I've also seen it with 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 the other people I've known who have similar situations. Um, you're talking about a situation which is caused by muscular tension, like at the, at the very pre deepest level of, you know, the base of the body, if you want, between the top and the bottom and the pelvic floor. Um, you're talking about becoming extremely tense there and then the muscles getting into to a situation where they're they're not allowing all the all the nerves passing through them to to uh, to pass easily and relax. You know what? So why are you doing that? Well, I suppose it's imaginable that you're doing that because because you have some physical job that actually requires some absolutely miserable racked up tight position for ten hours a day or something. But there can't be many people like that. So. Uh, a lot of what's going on is probably some kind of direction of energies there uh, that, that might better be explored and directed elsewhere. So again and again, I've seen, seen that people dealing with this have, have, have problems of, of constant tension. Funnily enough, um, I noticed that a lot of the people getting in touch with me were people who, like me, were working in two languages all the time, mm. uh, which caused an awful lot of tension, especially if you're constantly, like I was teaching in Italian, uh, so constantly anxious about, about my performance because, you know, you're teaching two Italians and you're in English, you make mistakes. And stuff. So, but I notice also that people who do get better from this, uh, Quite, quite quickly, are people who are very willing to take on the on board the idea of change, you know, mm. uh, and that that people who just say, "No, I'm going to give this the half hour that I would give to any 
problem. Like, like I want to go to the dentist and have my tooth fixed. I want to go here and have this fixed. I want to take my car in and have that fixed. And I want to take my pelvic floor here and have that fixed. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going to work. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would, obviously you don't want to invite people to start imagining that they have problems they don't have. But, but, point. but I, I just suspect that, you know, step back a bit from life and say, maybe we can ease off the gas and have a look at what's going on. It's probably a good idea. Yeah. So how does, how did you work with that resistance initially? Because in your book, of course, it didn't start off that way. You had to really, you had to go through a process. This was a, this was a life process and a self-discovery. What, what, well, how, in what ways did you work with that resistance, right? Because had somebody told you perhaps maybe in the very beginning, like, listen, like that, um, that Ayurvedic doctor you saw who, who really started to, you know, speak to you very frankly about the confounding contradiction of your personality, I think that's what it was. <laughs> so I'm curious about, you know, what advice can you offer around the, that like resistance that we all have to change? I mean, let's just be honest. We all have that, that resistance to change. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if anything I can say will, will do it. I mean, some, the point is, it's one of those questions where you, you understand that moment in the Bible where Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear. Huh. You know, um, you say it. If they want to listen, they'll listen. If they don't, they don't. Mm. But I remember I remember a situation at the pain clinic. I was invited to talk at the pain clinic in London um, at Great Ormond Street, which is in England, the place of last reference for people with chronic pain who haven't managed to solve it anywhere else. So these are very highly specialized guys and they'd read my book and they invited me to come and talk about it. Um, and afterwards we have a chat and, and they said, well, you know, we have discovered that Shatsu is extremely useful for these kind of problems, but we can't get any money from the government for Shatsu mm. because scientifically it's never been actually proved that Shatsu is right. Because of course you can't do a blind test for Shatsu because no. you can't <laughs> establish that everybody has the same problem and that everybody really did the same thing. And then right. that everybody, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of those places where the whole idea of scientific experimentation is in all kinds of difficulty. Um, but they said we get great results if people do it. It's the only thing that gives results uh, mm. that we know. Okay. Now, I suggested this to various people, and some people will do it and say, yeah, useful. Uh, and other people will say, no, I've read all this stuff on the net. The science doesn't say it's useful, so I won't do it. Mm. Why not do it? I mean, you could at least try it, you know. No, I won't do it. Uh, so some people are very, very close to that. But to go back to, to what you said, the book I wrote was in fact very much about how you pass from having a simple, what seems like a simple medical problem to an awareness of a whole life issue. Um, there were a number of steps. I had, I had had a, a genuine prostatitis problem many years before where a urologist had and wisely given me to read an Italian manual of urology, uh, which said prostatitis sufferers are worried, depressed, difficult people who usually end up getting operated in their 60s, you know. So I was, but what was interesting, what was useful in this rather unpleasant description, what was useful was that there was a psychological profile. Mm. And I remember when I went to get my first scan, uh, bladder scan, um, the echography they're called, I don't know what they're called in, uh, ultrasound scan, that's right, ultrasound scan. I, think. I said to the lady who did the scan, very nice lady, I said, uh, people with the kind of situation I have, what do they like? Uh, and she said, they're usually overworked, very busy guys, very, you know, so I began to get a sense that there was a psycho profile. And then there was the famous time when I was in Delhi for a, for a conference 
And I just thought, well, let's try it. Let's go to an Ayurvedic doctor. You know, I don't believe in this stuff, but who knows? Mm -hmm. And I went to this guy and he sat there with his wife, which I thought was very kind of not scientific to sit there with your wife. <laughs> you know, and they were, both, they were both very charming, very, very Western people, actually, very charming and uh, they listened to me and they made me talk for, you know, you can see that I could talk forever, but they, they made me talk for about half an hour. And, and then the guy said, mm. you know, well, you know, we could give you a few things, you know, to sort out your problem, a, a colon wash and stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, with herbs, you know, and oils. I said, but until you solve the profound problem in your personality, I don't see... And I'm thinking, how can this guy say this? You know, this is outrageous. He's only spoken to me for half an hour. But again, again, you just think, well, maybe, maybe I do know what he's talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, so th there you are. You know, it, it really is a question of if you, you know, in my case, maybe I wanted to hear this narrative anyway. It was a narrative I finally began to accept, and mm. acting on it was useful at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a Buddhist monk called or named Shanti Deva, and he once said, and maybe you've come across this saying that suffering has many good qualities. <laughs> what what was, if if any, the silver lining in all of this for you? Yeah, well, of course, you know, suffering has good qualities. It it, it rarely feels like that while it's going on, of course. Right. Uh, and very often after suffering, you're glad to forget it. Mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm glad not to think about some of the stuff I went through. But, of course, looking back, you have to say to yourself, um, I learned an awful lot, and uh, my life now is much more pleasant. I've, I've learned how to be amb ambitious without flogging myself. You know, ambition is a very dangerous master. Mm -hmm. uh, it can take over your life. Um, so... You know, there, there were all kinds of, you know, I, I love the meditation. I go to a meditation retreat once a year. I love it. I love the fact that I can be absolutely calm for 40 minutes every day and start my day calmly. Um, so, yeah, th there, there were positive things. I learned also, frankly, in other medical situations and in other questions when you're talking to other people and so on to be much slower in judging them and much mm. more open to the possibility that there's other stuff going on uh, like not to believe immediately anything a doctor tells you but but to accept they're telling you in good faith and and to mm. think about it so like one of the things you learn with meditation is to be less immediately reactive like that is only to react when you've actually t become aware of the situation um not to be sudden not to be you know uh so i think i think that's been very useful throughout throughout this i mean there was a moment when i was sort of offered an operation the famous terp the mm -hmm. transurethal blah 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 um that same day at that same moment I mean, if i'd accepted that it, it would have been like if i'd have accepted that it was a purely medical problem to solve with an intervention from that point on it would have been very difficult because then my body would have been changed and it would have been very hard to figure out what was going on mm -hmm. so not reacting immediately always getting mm. yeah i think a second opinion is is always useful particularly if the first opinion is drastic. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Good advice. Good advice. So to, before we hop off together, I, I, I would like to offer just um, the space for the men out there who are, are, are stuck in this rut and feeling hopeless about their current situation. What's one, if you had to share just one thing with them, what would it be? Difficult. The one thing uh, that this 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 is something you can deal with. It's just a question of backing off from it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
accepting it a bit more and don't try and solve it next week you know don't try and solve it next week just accept we're going to be on this road together for a while so uh we we better make friends you know yeah make some space one of my patients said this is a crock pot process not a microwave i love yeah. using that yeah. Yeah. exactly that, that's a very nice way to put it yeah, yeah. it makes it pleasantly domestic you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you know i suppose you know one thing one thing take it easy mm. you know which of course is is terribly easy advice to give <laughs> People write to me and you realize, you know, in the past I used to accept phone calls. Now I, I don't. But, you know, I remember you just suddenly think, God, this guy's so wired up. I was fine compared with this, you know. Mm. People phone you and you realize they're, they're you know, they're in, they're in very serious difficulty mentally and they're, they're talking about a physical problem. You just feel yes. calmed down, you yeah. know. Right, right. There's well, no separating. It's not, you know, it's, not, it's not like you've been, you know, they, with pancreatic cancer. It's not even COVID. You know, maybe actually COVID will be over quicker, but, you know, mm -hmm. anyway. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you so Thank much you. again for your wisdom, your wisdom and sharing your story, your narrative with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it was pr truly profound for me. Again, I'm, I'm biased because I, I really do really highly recommend your book. And um, so uh, how if if listeners wanted to learn more about you, uh, what would be the best way to connect or learn more about you or, of course, your book? But they will find <laughs> there's a website with all the books. There's a there's a Facebook page, which. I don't have friends on the page, but I just put articles up and, and uh, I, whatever I write, I put a link on Facebook or Twitter. Okay. Uh, I'm not a big Twitter social media person, but it's useful for putting up a, an article or a, a story or whatever. Yes. Thanks. Thank you so much again, Tim. And to all of our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for being here with us today. And as always, until next time, my friends, in loving wellness for your pelvis. This is Dr. Susie G. Thank you. Very nice. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to head on over to drsusieg.com where you can get more information, show notes, and related articles on today's topic. Also, if you like what you're hearing, head on over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks again.